Honestly, everybody has an interest in this because we all have an interest in being healthier longer. My name is Sonia Arison. I'm author of a new book called 100 Plus, How the Coming Age of Longevity Will Change Everything, from careers and relationships to family and faith. You know, I was writing a regular column for Tech Central Station at the time, maybe you remember it. Now I write for Tech News World as well, aside from doing books. Um, and uh, I was looking around for a topic, and one night I turned on the TV and there was this reality TV program, uh, The Swan, and Extreme Makeovers. Do you remember those two? And I saw these people who were radically changing their lives with plastic surgery. And, and I remember this one scene of these two people sitting on the edge of a bed crying because they were so happy. They had managed to, they had a tummy tuck or something, and now they were thin and they were so happy. And, um, and it got me thinking, you know, I wonder what else is out there. What other kinds of technologies exist that can help us change our lives for the better? And I started digging around and uh, I found a lot of stuff. And then I got really excited. You know, I found nanotechnology and gene therapy and tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, all these things. And I realized that a lot is going on that most people don't know about that's really going to radically change not only how long we live, but how healthy we are. And, um, and so I wanted to write a book not only so that people know about it, but also so that people can push harder for it to come to market faster because all of this stuff exists in the lab, regenerative medicine, growing new body parts for parts that are diseased, all of that exists in the lab. But getting it from the lab to the everyday person, there's often a large time delay and I want people to know about it so we can push for that to happen faster so that we can be healthier longer and more productive. A lot of this technology sounds like science fiction. You know, if I say to you, guess what? Scientists have grown a brand new human bladder for children and completely fixed them of their disease. You might say, oh wow, that sounds like, that sounds like something from a science fiction book. But it's not. It's real. Dr. Anthony Atella at Wake Forest University has done it. In fact, he did it in 1999 and didn't talk about it until 2006 because he wanted to make sure it actually worked. He didn't want people attacking his work and saying, oh, you know, you shouldn't be messing with this. Growing human organs in the lab with, with people's own stem cells, that sounds crazy, right? But it's not crazy. It's here. It's real. And bladders are only the beginning. Windpipes have been grown. There was a big case in the Wall Street Journal. A man in Iceland had a cancerous tumor the size of a golf ball in his throat. And, uh, and he was going to die. Chemotherapy wasn't working. And the scientist said, look, you have a choice. You can die, <laughs> or we can try to grow you a new windpipe in the lab. And so what did he choose? He chose to live. Uh, they used a new technique this time. They created the windpipe out of a na synthetic nanomaterials uh, based on a 3D model of his windpipe took some of his own stem cells, seeded it in the synthetic structure, incubated it in the lab for a few days, and then implanted it. Took out the old one, of course, and implanted the new one. And today he's cancer-free. He's completely cured. And that's such big news. I mean, it's really, really exciting, but it's only experimental. I mean, the average Joe on the street can't access that yet. And I want to see a day where they can. And there's other things that are going on in the lab. I mean, researchers have grown brand new hearts for rats, U.S. researchers say they've grown a beating heart in a lab. Hasn't been done for humans yet, uh, but they're working on pig hearts now. And I think they'll be successful with that. And if they are, that's very exciting, even at the pig level, because right now pig parts are used for human transplants. So, and, and the heart disease is the number one killer in America. Lungs have grown, been grown in the lab, I mean, all of these things. So we have the potential to get a big enough parts list so we can keep repairing humans, kind of like we repair vintage cars, right? You have a car that you love and you just keep replacing parts as it breaks down. And, and I see a day and then hopefully in the not too distant future, it depends on how long it takes to get from lab to consumer, um, where we'll be able to repair ourselves and live a lot longer and healthier. First off, every scientist will say that the biggest barrier are the, the scientific barriers, right? I mean, we've been able to grow lungs in the lab for rats, but can we do it for humans, right? I, I believe that it can be done, and, and uh, the U.S. military thinks so as well. They've put a lot of money, the U.S. Department of Defense has put a lot of money into uh, regenerative medicine because, of course, they want to be able to replace parts for soldiers who are wounded when they come back for war, from war. So the technical difficulties are uh, the biggest one. And, and then there's uh, the regulatory problems, the FDA, the various agencies that oversee these kind of techniques. 
Um, and then training doctors, right? Because this is a brand new thing. So you've got it, and you've got this whole generation of doctors out there who this is going to be brand new and really big news to. So then there's the training aspect and um, and all of that. So it's it's going to take some time. Nobody wants to sit in an old folks home and and weather away. That is absolutely not the goal. The brain question is a good question. And um, you know I, the the lower hanging fruit in the regenerative medicine basket is the things like the hearts and the lungs and the you know and the bladders and the windpipes. But when it comes to the brain, that's something different. It's it's more difficult. We don't understand it that well. And so I think that's going to be the biggest barrier, uh, especially since Alzheimer's is is such a big problem. But I'm hopeful on that. There's a number of folks in the technology community who are working on this question. And by the way, the, one of the points I make in the book is that biology is quickly becoming an information technology. Just like software programs are based on ones and zeros, now that we've sequenced the human genome, we have four letters for humans. It's the DNA, A, C, T, and G. And because we have that ability to reverse engineer the human body, we're going to be able to understand it better and hack it and repair it, right? And so to that end, um, people like Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, has put in a ton of money into a, the Paul Allen Institute in Seattle to reverse engineer the human brain. And they've mapped uh, the genome of the human brain, of the mouse brain, and they're really working on that. And then you've got other companies like IBM and Sony. Most people tend to think of those companies as, you know, they make computers, right? I mean, one of, one of their big dreams right now is to reverse engineer the human brain. IBM is putting a lot of resources into this, and Sony is also working on it. So it's, it's, it's very exciting. When we could live to be 150 years old in a healthy state, then when you're 90 years old, you feel more like you're 40, right? And so we'll have people who are older but still really healthy, and so they'll have all that experience um, and families will grow, of course. Um, you, you will not only have your mother-in-law, you'll have your grandmother-in-law around. So I think families will be become more complicated and more diverse. There'll be different types of pairings. You could imagine a 25-year-old getting married to a 90-year-old, and that 90-year-old still has a lot of time left if they're looking at a life expectancy of 150 years. So lots of interesting things can happen on the family front. On the economic front, uh, we'll be around a lot longer, so we'll be able to have... Well, there's the potential to have many types of jobs because we'll have time to go back and retrain. You know, in, right now, today, if you wanted to, you know, be a lawyer and a doctor, you can't really. It's tough to do that because both of those careers take a lot of training. But in the future, if you want to try both of those things and maybe even be an entrepreneur as well, you've got time to go back to school and learn new things and meet new people and and really use your experience and wisdom to create new things and, and try new things. So I think that's really exciting. Oh, yeah. With a lot of the regenerative medicine and the tissue engineering, like creating new windpipes in the lab or new bladders in the lab, uh, the scientists are actually using adult stem cells from the actual people. So there aren't a lot of ethical considerations with that on, in terms of uh, you know the embryonic stem cell debate or, or anything like that. I guess there's still the question of playing God, though, as you said. Uh, and you know, some people oppose the idea of extending health expectancy using science, any kind of science, stem cell or, or personalized medicine or anything like that, because they don't think we should be messing with nature. Right? Because if we mess with nature, all these things could go wrong. Maybe we'll overpopulate and run, and the earth will just get destroyed, and, and, and there, there's or new diseases will be unleashed, or, or any of these catastrophic things that they imagine. And I think it's important that we think about the ramifications of what we're doing. You know, how are we going to keep the earth clean and healthy while fewer people are dying? But ultimately, I don't, I don't think any of those arguments work. I think that, uh, that it's important to work as hard as we can to keep ourselves healthier longer and, and having more experienced people around helps us come up with better ideas and more innovations. Honestly, everybody has an interest in this because we all have an interest in being healthier longer.